Dr. Uh, Berlakis actually will do our next two uh, uh, talks. Uh, the first time uh, subbing for Dr. Vol, and he's going to specifically talk about uh, distal vessel coronary perforation, and he'll follow that up with uh, how to approach coronary stint loss. All right, great. Yeah, thanks very much, Tim. And again, thank you all for being here. There's going to be some overlap in the presentations, which actually is a good thing, because there are some common mechanisms about how to manage this, this perforation, so there's any complications. So um, we'll go over the distal perforation, and we'll discuss about this. And just to summarize that actually perforation is the number one concern for people doing CTO PCI and PCI in general. So you heard already about the main vessel perforation, which is big, big vessel ruptures. That's easy. Usually you understand very quickly that this is happening. You take care of it with a cover stand. What we'll talk right now is about the distal vessel perforation, which is when a small distal branch of a vessel ruptures. What can we do about that? This is a case. This is a patient with uh, some disease in the diagonal. The stand delivery was challenging. Note that the wire used was the Whisper Extra Support. And some of you may use Whisper wires or polymer jacketed wires as workhorse. However, uh, I think this has, may have increased risk. And uh, we typically recommend changing that for a regular wire after you do this. So we put the stand, and then we go through the checklist. And I think, especially for the fellows in the group, every, every time you do a, a procedure, you're going to make sure things are okay. You look at the stand, make sure the stand is not perforated the vessel, no dissection, and there is no occlusion of a side branch. But also, you want to look distally and see if there is good flow distally. And if you keep on looking, there is something that shouldn't be there. There's a little staining or extravasation you can call it many different ways. And the, 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 this potentially could be prevented if the wire was not a polymer wire. That's why it's good to change. But the bottom line is it's there. What do you do next? And what you do, we like to call it as the universal algorithm. Same way you have the universal definition for MI. The same as, as, as Mike Luna just mentioned. You're going to have a pathway to treat this. And the number one thing, there's no question, is to put a balloon up and stop the bleeding. Because the problem, the most acute problem, is having blood in the pericardium and having tamponade. You give fluids, pressures, as you heard. If you get hypotensive, you do pericardiosynthesis. You don't have to do it on everyone. If it's a small effusion, you may be bad without it. And then call the surgeons. You never know in life. If you don't need them, that's fine. And then you treat the cause. And then if it was a large vessel perf, as you heard, usually cover stand does it, or sometimes prolonged balloon. But for distal vessel perfs, embolization is usually the way to go. And this can be done mainly by fat or coils, and I'll show you down the line. So the patient was fine, and contrary to my, to my desires, we decided to leave him alone. So one hour later, he's having hypotension, we bring him back, and sure enough, there is a fluid effusion. And the message here is that small distal vessel perfs are tricky because you won't see tamponade immediately, but you'll go to the floor, and then one hour, three, four, six hours later, you get tamponade later on, which is much more dangerous because you're under the cath lab, and it may take a while for the people to treat him. This is how pulsus paradoxus looks like. Inspiration, blood pressure decreases, so you know you capture hemodynamic compromise. So you tap it. Interestingly enough, in perforations, you may be able to do a geograph, x-ray guided tap, because the fusion, you can see it very nicely. The heart in the middle is uh, less opaque, and the contrast in the pericardium, you can see where the pericardium is. Still, don't put your hands in the field. I know I'm crazy about this, but even in emergency, try to leave your hands out of there. Um, <laughs> unless you have a big ring like my partner. But um, the bottom line is, in this, after you do the precadocentesis, then now you have good blood pressure. Now what? You know it's there, you know it's bleeding, you have to do something about it, and again, doing embolization is the way to go. Fat and coil are the most uh, common ones. How do you select one of the two? Fat you cannot see unless you put in contrast. Fat is uncontrolled, you just put it in, but it's uh, available in everyone. And uh, there is zero cost. The coils need usually a larger microcatheter unless you have a specific coil that I'll show you. And then usually you, you may not have them. You don't have experience in using them, and they have high cost. Of course, cost doesn't matter in cases like this. So what do you do? Here's the perf. Microcatheter is advanced all the way to the, to the perf. And then you deliver the fat or the coil. This is how the fat looks like. How do you do this? Get a hemostat, go to the access point, close it, yang it out, doesn't work, do it again. It's a little brutal maneuver, but that's what you get out. And then the problem is, how do you get the fat in there? And actually, if you haven't done that, it can be very frustrating because you put the fat in and the fat flows out because it floats, so it tends to come out. So it keeps on, you're all stressed out and running, as you heard before in the chaos, and the fat keeps on slipping off the catheter. So the way you do this is a very creative technique we developed. It's patented, <laughs> but you can use it, no royalties are required. 
And what you do is you put it on the microcatheter, turn it upside down, and the fat floats because it's lighter than the water. It's a huge technique, believe me. When you need this, you'll remember my words. It's very, very useful to have the technique. And then you inject it. Actually, you can see it through the um, translucent part of the catheter, the fat going up. So you know it's leaving the catheter. It's not f floating out. So if I fine cross is here. You see the little marker, the fine cross. And then we put the first piece of fat. Still, there's some extravasation. Second piece, it may take more than one piece to get the extravasation, but eventually, you see there is no connection between the distal vessel and the fat. The patient did well. How do you know 100% you don't have continued bleeding? The way you know that is because you can give um, intravenous contrast, def definity. If you see any bubbles coming in the pericardial space, that means ongoing extravasation, but in this particular case, we didn't have that. You see nice opacification, no bleeding in the pericardium, and the patient did fine. And the other thing is, we didn't hit the patient and did not need pericardiocentesis because we didn't, we took care of it early on. I mean, I'm sorry, he, did, he needed the next one, did not. But if you do this early, you may avoid the pericardiocentesis and the problems that come with that. Second case, this is a CTO case. It's an RCA CTO, dual injection. You see distal RCA, small distal vessel. Under grade wiring, did not work. We tried to do dissection re entry, but we could not re enter. And um, eventually, we used a STAR technique as a last resort. And then after we did a balloon inflation, you see some contrast going through. And when I originally saw this, I thought, oh, that's a cavity, no problem. And then when I looked at it again, I'm like, that's not good. And that's when you have a rapid catecholamine surge, as you heard. And that's when you want to communicate that, that surge and also start getting things moving because things may go bad very quickly. And also, you don't, you don't want to ignore this. You want to make sure you understand what's going on and take care of it right away. What do you do? The universal algorithm, once again, put the balloon up and, 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 and stop the bleeding and then do some embolization. Most people have in their lab this kind of coils that are peripheral coils, 018. To deliver them, you need a bigger microcatheter like a prograde. What if you have a fine cross or Corsair or Caravel or Turnpike? Well, there, there are some neurovascular coils called, um, some, such as Axiom, there are other brands as well, and those can go through your end microcatheter. So that makes life so much easier because you put the coil in, then you pull this little trigger, you deploy it where you like, very controlled, only to change the microcatheter. So in this particular case, we did that. We did a technique called block and deliver. Balloon is up to stop the bleeding. And then we have the microcatheter there. And then coils are coming out. Now, if you haven't done that, you may be able to push the coils with the back end of the wire, which can go in the pericardium, lung, and potentially exit the skin. So you're going to stop it before that happens. That's not good form. And then uh, eventually, after putting the two coils, now you see it takes a while. The coils don't work immediately. So you put a coil in. Don't expect that the bleeding is going to stop instantaneously. It may take 3, 5, 10, 15 minutes. So you watch the patient. You have the balloon up here. There's no continued bleeding in the pericardium. And then eventually, after I think it was in case 10 or 15 minutes, the bleeding stopped. We have an effusion, but we haven't put a pericardial drain. And we did once again that contrast in, echo contrast injection. There is no ongoing bleed. So if you take care of it quickly, you may prevent the need for doing pericardiocentesis. Last case, that was a case of a calcified complex RCA. This is a workhorse wire here. It was very, very hard to deliver equipment here. And then uh, after a lot of efforts, the right coronary is looking a little better. But then, now we start seeing this stain, extravasation, you want to get any way you want to call it, that's, that's a problem. It's especially a problem if you have a bypass space, and so I'll show you down the line. So what do you do? Block and deliver. You get a balloon up, so there's no ongoing bleed. And then, in this particular case, you want to embolize this, but I couldn't get anything to go in here because it was a tiny, tiny vessel, and it was impossible to get a microcatheter in there. So I cannot put a coil, I cannot put fat. So what can you do? Well, what can you do is, um, take a cover stand and then place the cover stand over the origin of this perforated vessel. And when you do that, then there's no flow into the perforated vessel. You take care of it. So for very, very small vessels, putting a cover stand uh, is the way to treat it. And that's kind of an illustration. You have the perforation, balloon to stop the bleeding in there for now, and then get the stand down, deploy the stand, and then the cover stand. And then this cover stand will block the entry into the pericardium. One word of caution be extremely, extremely concerned for bypass patients. Because there are many case reports, I personally had a death from this, where patients come in and they have bypassed. You got a perf like this, small perf, no big deal. But in the bypass patients, instead of having an effusion, 
you get loculated diffusions that can compress a, a cardiac chamber and get into cardiogenic shock that you cannot tap because there's nothing to tap. It's all posterior or loculated. They may have to go to surgery. They may have to go for CT-guided drainage. So for these bypass patients, I personally am paranoid. I move as fast as I can, put a balloon up there, minimize the bleeding in the pericardium because very bad things can happen. So in summary, prevention, as you heard, is the key. So watch your wire. Don't use polymer jacketed wires to deliver stents if you want to use it to cross grade, but then microcatheter, trapping, switch it to a regular workhorse wire. If this alveolar happens, don't ignore it. This is something bad is going to happen. Take care of it right now versus later on. Know how to do the perforations, so the balloon up first, the block and deliver. And then if you haven't used the coil, call your coil rep and have them use one in front of your eyes so you know how it feels. There's nothing worse than putting the first coil when you have a perforation, everyone is running, you're stressed out, and that's an extra source of stress. It takes five minutes, deploy one coil on the table, you'll feel infinitely better when and not on wood if you're going to have a perforation like this. And lastly, in bypass patients, perforation is a big concern. Treat it as fast as you can because bad things can happen. Thank you very much. So we'll go to a little stress test. So listen how much you can put up with. So Dr. Vogue would not come, so I'm going to replace him. So I'm sorry, you're stuck with me again. And this time will be another, another complication. I have a great affinity. Somehow I've been um, asked to speak a lot about, about complications. I don't know why, but, um, <laughs> but I, I've, in over the years, I've developed a lot of experience in these complications. So it really gives me joy to talk about them. Um, this actually, I got an uh, my first, my first uh, big um, uh, stand loss was as a fellow. And actually, at the time, uh, I was fascinated by it. The patient had to go to bypass. It was a major complication. And then um, that made me look into this topic. So we published a paper like this that, uh, back in 2004, 2005. And, and, and it's actually come to serve me very well because the things I learned by doing this project have come up again and again in multiple settings. So why do you lose a stand? First of all, the stands are hard to lose but not impossible. But the most common reason you lose a stand is you try to get a stand through a lesion, usually calcified torches. Now, the stand gets stuck in the lesion, or by pushing it, you deform it. Stand comes back, and then it gets stripped off the balloon or the guideliner. That's the most common technique. You push it in, doesn't go, you pull it back, it's been deformed, you pull it, you strip it off, and there you go. And this is how it looks. You see this little strut, stand strut is kind of dislocated. But the one thing you should know about stand loss is you don't always have to get the stand out. There's this misconception, the stand gets lost, oh my God, why can't we get it up? Well, in the majority of cases, actually, it may be faster, easier, safer to just leave it where it is, get a balloon, deploy it, or if you cannot deploy it, get a stand and crush it, and by doing that, then you just, no problem, you move on with your case, no big deal. So how do you, um, how do, you do that? You have the stand there, if you can get the balloon through it, great, if not, you get a second wire in, balloon next to it, and you uh, deploy the stand. This is one reason, potential stand loss, why I personally like doing complex PCI in calcified torsus vessels with eight French guides. Stand loss through eight French guide, it's a completely different experience than the stand loss through a six French guide, let alone five French guide. Uh, because then you have all these options available to you. Getting more balloons, getting more stands, retrieving is much easier as well. The most common technique, if you want to retrieve it, and the easiest is, get get a, what's called a small balloon technique. So if you have wire through, you get a small 1.25 or 1.5 millimeter balloon, you get it through the stand, inflate the balloon distally, and then pull everything back, and hopefully the balloon will kind of trap the stand, and then when you pull it back, it's going to either bring it in the guide or bring it enough in the guide that you can just pull everything out and retrieve the stand and the balloon altogether. If it doesn't work and you have to get the stand out, for example, if it's in the left main or a very dangerous position in the coronary, what you can do is get a snare, and then the snare can snare the back end of the stand and then pull everything back again. You lose the wire position, but in those circumstances, that's the least of your problem in general. Knowing how to use snares, of course, is critical for this, and in general, the three-loop snares are the most commonly used uh, compared to the single loop, the amplitude goose neck snares, because it's easier to capture things with the three-loop snares. If you don't have a snare, you can actually make one. This is one way to do it. Get a multi-guide or diagnostic, put a 300 wire through it, 
make it back, and then now you have a snare, you pull this part of the wire, you can actually retrieve things through this handmade snare. There's another a way to make a snare using a guide liner. This is the guide liner, this is again one wire, you, and you put a balloon inside here with the guide liner. The balloon actually, the wire goes around, and the balloon is inflated in the guide liner, and then kind of traps this back end of the balloon, so you can push and pull the end of the wire, and by doing that, you can increase or decrease the size of your loop. And this is how this looks like. You, you see that when we're pushing the wire, the loop gets bigger. We're pulling the wire back, the loops get smaller. So once again, easy way to create a, a snare if you don't have a snare that is pre-made in your lab. And then by doing that, you can use it for lost tens or other things like snaring the retrograde guide wire if you use retrograde CTO PCI. So this is a case uh, of stent loss. Uh, mid RCA lesion looks pretty good. You will predilate it. We'll put the stent. And then things don't look that great. You see the stand is there, but we don't really see much. There still uh, looks like some uh, dissection. Uh, flow is not the best. So what's going on? So we had to do IVERS, as you heard, to understand what's going on. There's a dissection you can see very nicely. But as you may notice, there's something missing there. <laughs> and that's something. The question is, where is that something? So after 10 minutes of search, we found it. So we came in, and um, the stand was actually in the garbage can. So when you take the stand of the balloon, if you don't pay attention, you can strip off the whole thing, goes in the garbage can, you put the balloon in, you think you stand it, and then you have anxiety, and then you find it, and everything is good. So this is one of the unpublished mechanisms of stand loss. Again, I'm going to patent this technique too. So if, when you take the stands off the balloon, be careful. So it turns out if you actually put a stand in there, it works. <laughs> So you have to get the stand to the lesion if you want it to work. <laughs> Here's another case. This is a, a case before the use of guideliners. This is calcified um, uh, distal left main, and there is some disease in the circ. Delivering things was very hard. And then, after trying, the stand was tip of the balloon. So we have a combination of things here. You have acute vessel closure, and uh, we have also a stand lost in the left main. So exciting times, and there is this principle that... Uh, Complexity begets complexity, things get back, and what do you do next? Um, control the chaos, as you heard from Mike Luna before. But uh, uh, as I mentioned before, don't, you don't have to get it out. In cases like this, you have so many things going on, acute vessel closure, just crush the stand or deploy it. That may be all that you need. Three or balloon, uh, crush the stand, everything looks good. Uh, we try to deliver more stands, and they keep on having this problem. So uh, after you did this, twice, and we lost the stand twice and crushed it twice, now we're starting to get a little metal build up in the main. So the stenosis is going to be really low, really low in this patient, which is the good part. It's always a good part in every complication. But the question is, you still have some, you have to deliver a stand there. How are you going to do this? In this day and age, we now have guidelines. At the time, we didn't. But we had a catheter called Proxys, which is very similar to a guideliner. So by advancing it through that area, then you can deliver the stand. It won't get, it won't get stripped off, and then you can... Um, get a, a nice result in the end and bail out. So today with the guide catheter extensions, guideliner, Godzilla, that can really facilitate how you do um, all that. This is a different case. This was a case of uh, an LAD that the stent got stripped off and was into the left main protruding into the aorta. And um, we had to use a three-loop snare. And this is always a little stressful situation because if you notice here, once we retrieved it, we really had a very, very small part of it. So if the stent were to fly out, into the order, that would have been a big problem. But fortunately, we're able to get it out, and um, the patient did well. And this is one of the all-time best uh, films. This is the first fluoro. So uh, our fellow had a hard time advancing the guide. And the question is, why did he have a hard time? <laughs> and the patient had the procedure three months prior. And as you can see, um, this is a very interesting differential diagnosis. This is a peripheral stent. <laughs> Now, it's not supposed to be the ascending aorta. It's supposed to be down in the leg. But, you know, with a little gentle forward push, you can get that stand to go places it's not supposed to be. But no problem, because we are familiar with retrieving stands. The good news is it came down, so that's a good thing. We use the homemade snare. This is how the homemade snare looks. A wire goes through the multipurpose diagnostic catheter. This is a huge target, so it was not hard to... Uh, to snare it. Actually, he would try to first um, get the wire around from the other side, and then the stand now is on the aortic, um, uh, distal aortic bifurcation. We finally were able to drag it all the way down. That iliac looks a little bad, but better being the iliac than in the coronary. 
And uh, after we put a stand over it, uh, patient did well and uh, the problems were solved. So in summary, stand loss is something that can happen, but prevention, like everything else, is the key. So before you put it in, you want to prepare the lesion. Good predilation with high pressures, make sure if it's a calcified lesion, do you do, need to do a therectomy beforehand. And then if, despite all that, you still lose the stent, make sure you don't lose your wire. There's this stress moment and everything is moving and the wire gets pulled up. And now you make things so much worse. So if you keep the wire in the stent, then if you need to retrieve it, the small balloon technique is the easiest one. If it works, it's great and it works in many cases. If it doesn't, then in many cases, just putting a balloon in, deploying the stent, or getting another wire and crossing the stent may be all that you need. And then... Um, the main thing, as you heard before, is keep calm. If something like this happens, it's going to be okay. There is no, usually not acute vessel closure. You don't have to move very quickly. Take your time, methodically move from step to step, and results will be great. So thank you very much.